So let's talk about answering atheists. I'm reminded about a story about an elderly lady who was minding her own business and she's reading her Bible. And all of a sudden, a gentleman walked up to her and, and he was an atheist and he accosted her and said, you can't believe that. You can't believe that stuff is in that Bible. She said, well, I do. I believe it. In fact, I believe it cover to cover. It says Holy Bible and I believe the cover. It's correct. He says, well, now, come on. There's all kinds of stories in there that you can't believe, like uh, you can't believe about Joan and the whale. She said, oh, yeah, I do. She said, it's in the Bible and I believe it. Well, this atheist who wouldn't let go over, he said, well, come on. Explain to me how somebody can get swallowed by a whale and be in the stomach for three days and then get thrown up and live to tell about it. She said, well, I don't know. She said, but someday when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah and he can explain it to me. And the atheist said, well, what if Jonah's not there? She said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Well, we're going to talk about answering atheists. If you've got your Bibles, you're welcome to turn. I've got most of the verses this evening on the overhead, but we're going to be looking for starters at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. I'll give you just a minute to turn and we'll open up in a word of prayer. Our Father, we are thankful now for this time to be able to gather together. I pray you might still our hearts as we come before you, as we seek to arm ourselves with answers for those that would ask us of the hope that lies within us. Lord, I pray that we might do it with meekness and fear, not with a smug, proud countenance, but with a willingness, Lord, to be humble, realizing that where those who are skeptics and atheists and evolutionists sit today, we once were lost and without the knowledge of the dear gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we might take it upon ourselves to be willing to give a defense, to discipline our mind, to learn that which we can used for apologetic purposes. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Here's the key. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you ready for an answer? If atheists came to you and said, How do you know there's a God? Why do you believe that? Well, any one of us, if we're true Christians, should at least be able to say, well, let me tell you what God did in my life. Uh, so, you know, even if you're just newly saved, you can give some answer. But it becomes incumbent upon us. It's not an option. The verse states it as a command for us to be ready to give an answer, for us to arm ourselves with answers for apologetics. And so as we look at it, I want to go through four simple points tonight. What is an atheist? Number two, the influence of atheism. Number three, evidence for the existence of God. And lastly, we'll wrap it up by looking at some of the practical implications for us as Christians. So what is an atheist? Now, this is informal. We're even dressed informal. So I'm looking for some participation. And if you don't participate, I'm going to pick on you. Doesn't that mean? Yes, over there. Ooh, really good. Did you look at my outline? What he said was, ah, which is the negative in the Greek, and theos, which is God. It's someone that posits the non-existence of God. That's it. It's just simple. He says, I, no, there's no God. Now, someone has said there's no such thing as a real atheist. You maybe heard the saying, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. Right? So we have questions about it. Sometimes they waffle back and forth about whether they're really atheists or not. But how about this question? Are atheists religious? Well, they don't believe in God, though. Huh? They have a faith. Is it a position of faith to say there's no God? Absolutely. You can't prove a universal negative. We haven't been everywhere in the universe. It absolutely is a position of faith. The Humanist Manifesto, written all the way back in 1933, tenet number one says religious humanists, they identify themselves as religious humanists, regard the universe as self-existing and not created. That's tenet number one. Tenet number two says humanism believes that man is part of nature and has emerged as a result of a continuous process. Now, what's that continuous process they're talking about? Evolution, right? So there is a religious component to atheism. Well, how about this question? 
Why doesn't the Bible argue for the existence of God? Ever wonder that? The Bible just starts, in the beginning, God. Oh, time out, time out. How do we know? Well, the Bible does give us some arguments for God in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to get to some of those. But I think that the reason that it doesn't is because every man in their heart of hearts, when they're in the quietness of their own conscience, they know there's a God. The Bible says in Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. Folks, you have to educate yourself out of believing there's a God. The simple and the ordinary and the logical thing to do is to believe that all of that we see was created. And so you have to deny that light to yourself and turn yourself into a fool. My friend, when God calls somebody a fool, they are indeed a fool. Well, then we have some of these philosophies that are similar to atheism. Agnostics. You might hear agnostics. These guys are a little more sophisticated. They don't want to get into the universal negative thing. So they'll say, well, we just don't know if there's a God. Again, the Greek A uh, would be the negative and gnos is knowledge. So they're agnostics. Then we have naturalists. And naturalists come along and say, well, we don't allow any supernatural in science. We don't even want to talk about if there's a God. You want to talk about creationism? Go on down to the religion classroom and get out of the science classroom. We'll talk a little more about that tomorrow night. But that's the naturalists. And there are lots of those guys out there. And then the humanists. And the humanists say, man is God. Man is the ultimate. Man is all that there is. The pinnacle of evolution. Then the rationalists come along and they say, well, now, we can't buy all these miracles and stuff. There's probably some truth in the Bible, just like there's some truth in Shakespeare, and there's some truth in what Buddha taught and what the Koran teaches. But uh, when we get to the miracles and some of this other stuff, no, 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 no. And you get the modernists, and, and they're the skeptics, and they say, science and philosophical thought should supersede the Scriptures. And they're the religious liberals out there. So some of these folks would be kissing cousins with the atheists, and you might hear some of those terms bantered around out there. Well, let's talk about the influence. It might surprise you to know that atheists are less than 10% of the population. Say, well, why are we even talking about them then? Well, only one in ten even claims to be an atheist. Well, their influence is far more than their numbers might lead one to believe. They're very active in the arenas that set the philosophical agenda, particularly in the scientific leadership. Uh, I've spoken at public schools, public colleges, and I get quizzical looks on this thing. Like, come on, you know, don't tell me that they're infiltrating and you've got some big uh, conspiracy theory here. Well, I can prove it. Here is a poll of the National Academy of Sciences. Guys, these are the who's who. These are the folks that write the textbooks, that set the agenda uh, philosophically in the scientific com community. And this National Academy of Sciences polled, they surveyed all their members in the biological and physical sciences and just over half responded. Get this. 72% were overtly atheistic and 27% were agnostic. Only 7% believe in a personal God. What's that telling you? That's telling you that it's the flip opposite of the population at large. The inmates are running the asylum. We've got all these guys at the helm of the good ship science that are atheists. Is it any wonder that we get the scientific curriculum that we get? Is it any wonder we get the decisions from the school boards that we get? The atheists are running the show. And that's part of my burden is to change that. Here is a quote from a guy named Professor Watson. He wrote Nature magazine. He's one of the leading biologists and science writers of his day, and he demonstrated the atheistic bias in much of evolutionary thinking when he wrote, Evolution is a theory universally accepted, not because it can be proven by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. What's he saying? Is he saying he was convinced by the evidence? Huh? No. He didn't want to believe it. See? It's his worldview that leads him to the conclusion, not the scientific evidence. Very important. Well, let me give you some of the evidence for the existence of God. If you want to take notes, this would be a good time to start. I'm going to give you a handful of key reasons, answers, things that you could give people if they say, why do you believe in God? This is kind of like the little nugget right here. Five key reasons. Evidence for the existence of God. Some big words, but if you hang tough with me, you can handle it. 
cosmological. That's the first big word. Write it down. Number one, the first argument for the existence of God is the cosmological argument. That is, the effect of the universe's existence must have a suitable cause. Folks, very simple. We live in a cause and effect world. If I'm standing up here on stage and kind of get to the edge here of the auditorium and you see me kind of stand on the edge and all of a sudden you see my head kind of do a little twist around and I go flying out and I land on the floor, you're going to say something happened to him. You know, maybe Phelps was back there and he just got mad at him and punched him upside the head. But we saw the effect and we assume there must be a cause for that effect. Right? Sometimes we see the cause and we look for the effect. But we live in a cause and effect world. Now follow me. What caused the universe's existence? What chicken laid this egg? Big question. Philosopher, philosophers have asked it for eons. The cosmological argument. What started it? Well, the scientists have come along and said, Oh, we've got an answer for that one. What? So the Big Bang caused it. Okay. The Big Bang caused it. Well, that's, that's nice. But I've got a question for you. What caused the Big Bang? You see where I'm going with this, right? And sometimes they'll get kind of a weird look on their face like that. But every once in a while they'll say, Oh, it's the condensation of the vapor cloud. You see, this vapor cloud went and condensed. And then went boom and exploded. It was the condensation of the vapor. That's what did it. Okay, it's condensation of the vapor cloud. Uh, what did the vapor cloud come from? So we can do this all day long, right? It's kind of like the Hindus. You heard the story of the ancient Hindus? Some smarty pants came along and said, you know, what's holding the world up? Oh, well, we know the Greeks believed it was Atlas, right? But the Hindus, they hadn't got that far yet, so they started to think about it, and they said, well, the world, I, we got it. The world sits on the back of a big turtle. Or a big, a big elephant. big elephant. Okay? And that lasted for a while. Then somebody came on and said, wait a minute. What's the elephant stand on? And this was like a major crisis. They had to get a summit meeting together, you know, and get all the guys in there and, and all the gurus. And they finally figured out that, uh, well, the elephant stands on the back of a big turtle. Oh, okay. That, 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 that kind of answered the question for a little bit. And then somebody says, wait a minute. What's the turtle stand on? And, oh, my goodness, they hadn't figured that one out. So they got back together again, and they went through the whole thing, and they figured out the turtle swims in the clouds. And that was the answer. That's how, it, that's how it lasted. And it's not too different than what the scientists say with the vapor cloud. But, folks, there's only three possibilities. If you keep asking the question long enough, you've got to get back to one of three things. I've never had anybody give me another option. There's only three options. One is eternality of matter. That is matter in our cause and effect world, obeying the various laws of gravity and thermodynamics, etc., matter is all there is and has always been here. That's one of the three possibilities. Remember the Humanist Manifesto? Religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing. It was not created. Remember Carl Sagan? Cosmos? The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. That's possibility number one. Now, you can believe that if you want, but we have this problematic little law called the law of thermodynamics. And the law of thermodynamics says that things go from order to disorder. It's a law. There are no known violations to it. I was a physics major. We studied the law of thermodynamics. Very important law. And the order that we see around us in the universe is problematic. It's winding down. What wound it up? If it's been there forever, it should long ago have been wound down. We should be in energy debt by now. So you can believe it's been there forever. But there are no scientific laws to back you up. The second one is spontaneous generation. That is, there was nothing. Flat, zero, nothing, and all of a sudden, pow! You got a beautiful ordered universe. You say, oh, come on, Dave. Nobody believes that. Oh, yeah? This is 1989, Annotated Teachers Edition of General Science. And it says, I'm reading from page 362, In the realm of the universe, nothing really means nothing. Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from this state of nothingness, 
the universe began in a gigantic explosion about 16.5 billion years ago. Well, that's the ultimate free lunch. Here's Discover Magazine. The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. There you go. Now, you want to believe that? You can believe that. But, folks, that is a position of pure faith. We don't see molecules, matter, popping into existence from nothing. We just don't. Anywhere in the known universe. You want to believe it? You can believe it. But it's pure faith. It's far more reasonable to believe in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Folks, the only other option is intelligent design. That's the only three you've got. Eternality of matter, spontaneous generation, or intelligent design. Now, right about now, I'll get asked the question. Some atheist that's maybe one step ahead of me will say, ha, I'll play your own game on you, Wetzel. Where did God come from? So you still haven't solved the problem. You've got to explain God. Oh, time out. Hang on now. God does not obey the laws of a cause and effect world. God is by definition supernatural. He doesn't obey the natural laws. I don't have a problem with that. If you want to say there is no God, then you must live and die by the laws of nature. You've got the problem, not me. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay, the cosmological argument. Psalm 19, verse 1, I referenced it this morning. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Next, we have the teleological argument. Teleological argument. Now, this is a little different. It doesn't talk so much about the universe's existence, but the universe's design. If we look at the universe, it's not just kind of out there in kind of a big, you know, happen chance sloth. It's very carefully designed. There are intricate laws, laws that allow us to do science. We could conceive of universes where you drop a book and five times it goes down and five times it floats off. We don't have consistency in laws like gravity. We can conceive universes where life could never possibly even exist where there wouldn't be an ordered planet like the planet Earth with its incredible diversity and with its incredible biological complexity. So, what is the rationale for this design? We have these teleological evidences or design evidences and basically we ask questions like this. Could a fine-tuned universe come out of an explosion? What are the odds? of everything being just exactly right. Folks, do you know if our Earth was a little bit further away from the sun, guess what would happen? It would get colder and colder and we'd kind of just go stiff, right? We'd turn to ice men. What if we were a little closer to the sun? It'd burn up, right? We have to be just the right distance from the sun. And then we got the moon kind of spinning around there that's just holding the Earth at just the right angle and balancing it so that we've got our seasons and maintaining the orbits. And then we're just in the right place in the solar system so we don't have all kinds of nasty asteroids and comets constantly bombarding us. And, you know, all these specific things that are in there that are critical to maintain complex life. So we have the ideal environment for life on the Earth. Could this be the result of a mindless chance? And then what about the laws? that allow us to have rational life? Why do we have the strong nuclear force just right and the weak nuclear force just right and the laws of gravity just right and all these constants right there? A guy named Greg Easterbrook, he wrote a book called Besides Still Waters, A Search for Meaning in an Age of Doubt. I don't even know if he's a Christian, but he writes this. He says, The cosmos is hurtling outward at a remarkably balanced velocity. If the expansion were slightly less, the universe would have collapsed back on itself soon after its birth. If it were slightly more rapid, the universe would have dispersed into a thin soup with no aggregated matter. Now get this, the ratio of matter and energy to the volume of space at the birth of the universe must have been within one quadrillionth of one percent ideal. What's he saying? He's saying if you could explode it one quadrillion times, you might get one like we would got. Now folks, that's like me going out and winning the lottery ten times in a row. I mean, what's the odds of me getting one winning lottery ticket in my life? Now, if somebody won it five times or ten times in a row, you'd say, it's rigged. 
It's, I mean, there's a court in the land that wouldn't convict that guy of having a rigged lottery. Right? And yet folks want to believe that we got this beautiful universe, this incredible earth, by pure chance. And then stack on top of it all the mutations that have to happen for complex life and all the other stuff. Folks, these people have faith that's incredible. These atheists do. They say, well, it's amazing. It's a very fortunate accident. And that would be the atheistic worldview. Folks, we look at that exact same evidence and we say, incredible design. There must be a great designer. And that would be the Christian worldview. It's not like they have a different set of evidence than we do. It's their worldview that colors the way they interpret the evidence. If you've got your Bibles with me, I'd like you to turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. And I'd like you to just kind of keep in Romans chapter 1 for the rest of the session because I want to walk you through Romans chapter 1 in kind of an orderly uh, and logical manner. Paul, uh, obviously tremendously trained and articulate, uh, is led by the Holy Ghost, um, much like a lawyer approaches his case in Romans, in the book of Romans. And we see in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 the first step in a logic flow here. It says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. How are they seen, Paul? By and understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they're without excuse. We talked about this morning. It's general revelation. There's some things you should know about God just from looking at the world round about you. This is the teleological argument. The teleological argument. You look at the at a design and you say, what is the odds that rain and wind and snow would just make these three faces on this mountain? Could it have happened by chance? And intuition, logic, experience tells us, no, it could not have happened by chance. The odds are too much against it. I mean, you might get something that looks freaky a little bit like a head, but the odds of all four of these things being carved up there, it isn't going to happen. And yet that's the kind of leaps that the evolutionists have to take. Well, let's hurry on. We have another argument here. The anthropological argument. I told you there can be some big ones. Anthropological. The innate awareness of a higher moral law signifies there is an absolute meaning to life. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 19. Romans 1, 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest where? Where is it manifest? In them. For God has showed it unto them. Okay? Look up here. If the first argument was an argument about creation, I'm looking for another C. The second argument is an argument from... I hear it back there. Yes, give that lady a gold star. Well done. Conscience. An argument for conscience. God has put the light where? Inside us. We've got no excuse. Not only do we have general revelation out there, we've got a moral fingerprint of God inside us. The anthropological evidence. You see, naturalism and physicalism fail to explain the whole of human experience. There's something in there. There's a fingerprint. There's something inside of us that says it's not just naturalism and physicalism. Folks, if you don't want to acknowledge Almighty God, the God of the Bible, you're going to acknowledge somebody. Somebody's going to make the rules. How do you like Adolf Hitler? Anybody for him? Right? Somebody's going to be in charge and going to become God. Someone has to decide what's right and what's wrong. And so at the end of the day, somebody becomes God with a little g. Ravi Zacharias wrote this book, Can Men Live Without God? And he says, we know that without God, there is a loss of a sense of wonder and meaning. What does he mean by that? If we're here only as a fortuitous chance of swirling chemicals that got together and just happen chance formed our brain, then can you really blame somebody for being a criminal? Can you really blame somebody for being sexually perverted? Can you blame somebody for, you know, being a pyromaniac? It's just the way their chemicals happen to line up. We're all here with a bunch of chemicals. Folks, if you follow atheism to its logical extension, that's where you'll get. A guy by the name of Bertrand Russell, one of the most famous atheists, wrote this. Man is a product of causes that had no provision 
of the end they were achieving. His origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves, his beliefs are all but the outcome of an accidental co-location of atoms. No fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve any individual life beyond the grave. It's a very lonely, a very cold, and very deterministic outcome if you're a philosophically consistent atheist. And you know, in our heart of hearts, we know better. Then we have the ontological argument. But you know what? It's 7.30. I want you to stand up. I want you to scratch, turn around, shake hands with somebody behind you. Real quick. Stand up. Everybody, stand up. We're at halftime. Turn around. Shake hands with somebody. Wave to somebody. If somebody fell asleep, wake them up. Wake them up. Don't let them keep sleeping. Okay. All righty. Good going there. Dan Nelson got halfway across the auditorium that fast and back in. Well done, brother. He, he had to shake everybody's hand. Okay. Let's jump back in here now. The ontological argument. You might not be real familiar with this term. This term has the idea of the thought. Where do we get the thought? Where do we get the idea of God from? The implanted idea of God in the conscious soul points to the supernatural. You know, if we look at trees or grass or these flowers that are up here, they have a physical presence. They have a body. That's it. Okay? What if we looked at Grandpa? I mean the ape. I mean the ape. I mean the ape. Uh, what if we looked at this ape here? Now, he's got a little more than those flowers, right? There's something going on there that's different from just the flowers. He's got, we could say, a body and a soul. There's in him a mental ability. There's some feeling. There's some ability to uh, sense things. Uh, and, and think things through. There's a little bit of something else inside there. But you know, no ape has ever built an altar. No ape has ever offered a sacrifice. And yet every single tribe anywhere in the world that you go to has felt the compulsion to worship. There's something in us that's different. Where do we get this idea of God from? At what point in the evolution of humanity did a consciousness slip in? And why would it? What's the evolutionary benefit for being reflective? There's none. I mean, evolution should be cold-hearted, you know, no feeling, hard, struggle for existence, and survival of the fittest. That's why Adolf Hitler did what he did. That's the way you're going to get ahead, right? That's the evolutionary paradigm. Blaise Pascal said, What else does this craving, this helplessness proclaim, but that there was once in man a true happiness, of which all that remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there, the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since the infinite abyss can only be filled with the infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. There's this God-shaped hole in the soul. It's undeniable. And evidence for the existence of God. Ecclesiastes 3, 11 and 12 says, He's made everything beautiful in His time. Also, He set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God makes from the beginning to the end. That word world is the word eons. This whole of history, this reflectiveness upon what's happening and why we are here and the philosophical questions. It's in us! It's part of who we are. It's part of what's being human. Consciousness. And evolutionists have admitted this is a problem. Uh, these guys, Eccles and Robinson, in this article called The Wonder of Being Human, Our Brain and Mind, they wrote this. We believe that the emergence of consciousness is a skeleton in the closet of orthodox evolutionism. It remains just as enigmatic as it is to an orthodox evolutionist as long as it's regarded as an exclusively natural process in an exclusively materialist world. Now, folks, this is a mainstream scientific publication that it was written in. It's a problem for the evolutionists. The last argument is the scriptural argument. I'm not going to develop this today. I know Dr. Phelps has a whole series he speaks on this. But suffice it to say that what we hold in our hands is a miracle. We could look at the historical evidence, the scientific evidence, the fulfilled prophecy, the uniqueness of the book, and the evidence of changed lives. And we could say truly... The Bible itself is evidence that there is a God. This book could not come along by pure chance. So there they are, the five arguments 
for the existence of God. I'll just go back as I move fast there. Did everybody get that? Everybody that's taking notes, get it. Cosmological, teleological, anthropological, ontological, and scriptural. Five arguments. Question on that. Any of them? Anybody with a question? Okay, either all fell asleep or I answered them all. Or you got a shy, bashful bunch here, Dr. Phelps. Okay, everybody with me out there? About now, I have folks that are saying, that's fine. That's fine. It's all very cerebral. What's but what does it mean to me? Well, Colossians 4, 5 to 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Remember, that's incumbent upon us to be armed to provide an answer. That's our obligation as Christians, to prepare ourselves day by day by day to better adorn the Word, to be able to present God's Word and provide a logical defense. And so... If nothing else, it allows you to do that. But there is also the practical implications. What does it really mean to me? And I want to give you a quote from American Atheist. It's a guy named Richard Bozarth. And I want you to think about what he's saying here. He writes, Christianity has fought, still fights, and will continue to fight science to the desperate end over evolution. Because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble, you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning of His death, and Christianity is nothing. What this all means is that Christianity cannot lose the Genesis account of creation, for Christianity is fighting for its very life. A bit of a blasphemous statement? No? But here's the point. This guy gets it. He gets the fact that if we lose Genesis, if we lose the reliability of God's Word in Genesis chapter 1, then how can we believe it in John chapter 14? He understands that if he can undermine the foundations, what will the righteous do? And folks, these atheists get it. And too many Christians don't get it. We're out there worried about our retirement portfolios and picking daisies in the backyard and making our house pretty. Nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But folks, we're missing the fact that we're in a battle for the souls of men. What advances have you done in this last week for the cause of Christ in Indianapolis? How about the last month? How about the last six months? about the last year. Folks, you have to understand that God has left you on this earth for a reason. And it's not to warm a church pew. We're glad you're here. I hope you come every night. But God's left you here not to build a beautiful house. That's great. Not to have a great title at work. That's wonderful. Not to have a big bank account. That's nice. But God's put you here because there's a war going on. And the atheists get it. And we need to be engaged. And there's a post for you. And there's a post for me. And while God tarries, and while He's left us on this earth, we need to be engaged. Folks, this does matter. It does make a difference. Adolf Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, people will believe it. Was Hitler correct? Yes, he was correct. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik that put the first satellite in space. And the United States was dumbfounded. Oh, my goodness. We're caught, flat-footed. The Soviets are beating us in the space race. We've got to get serious about this. This has uh, got to be a national priority. Well, it just so happened a couple of years later, 1959, was the 100-year anniversary of Darwin's book. <clears throat> so what they did is they said, look, the Soviets, they're an atheistic state. We've we got to get serious about teaching evolution. We had no more of this monkey business about creation or soft peddling it. We've got to teach evolution like the Soviets are doing. And so they began to crank money and research and, and uh, put out textbooks into the public school systems. And then, of course, in 1962, 63, prayer went out the window in the public school systems. And we saw a major change in the way young people were taught in our school systems. And what happened was that the teaching of evolution, which in 1960 was at two to 3,000 words, skyrocketed. And by 1962, 1963, it peaked at about 30,000 words. 
We're talking a tenfold increase in the teaching and evolutionary theory. Okay? Well, the facts are in now. Let's see what happened in our school systems in that time period. Here is a statistic. Unmarried couples living together. Since 1963, well, prior to 1977, unmarried couples living together was such a small group. The data was only collected in the 10-year census, so we really don't have data before that. But a 725% increase. Massive increase. Here's SAT scores. SAT scores, 1963, they're kind of bobbling along there, and then boom, they dropped off the edge of the cliff. Birth rate for unwed girls ages 10 to 14. Giving birth, 10 to 14. 1963, it was going down. Now it's up 100%. You say, well, it's not as bad as some of the other statistics. Well, pregnancies are up 553%. What's the difference? It's called abortion. STDs actually going downhill. About 1963, that changed dramatically. Ages 10 to 14, up 385%. Divorce rates was actually going down. 1963, turned around, went way up. About 1990 or so, it kind of peaked and it's kind of dropped off. Why, why is that? Everyone's decided they're going to be a lot more committed in their marriages. They don't bother to get married anymore, right? They just shack up. So that's the only reason that's flattened out, flattened out and gone down a little bit. Here's a, here's a real key one. Up to 1963, violent crime. Remember, we're talking in school here. We're talking high school. 1963, it's following the population growth. After that, it increases 995%. Teachers in public school used to have to worry about people putting gum on the bottom of their chairs, wadding up paper and throwing it behind the teacher's back. Somebody, you know, making fun of somebody in the playground. Now they have to worry about rape, murder, people bringing, you know, automatic guns into the school underneath their cloaks and shooting the school up. Crime, violent crime, all through our school systems, 995% increase. If you've got your Bibles open to Romans chapter 1, the Bible predicts this, that when the light of conscience and creation is denied in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21 it says because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools remember the fool has said in his heart there's no God these evolutionists they think they're the smartest people in the room they've got doctors and all kinds of degrees so they're really smart but professing themselves to become wise they became fools Folks, it does matter what students are taught. There are implications. When we tell someone that they're nothing but an evolved ape, we shouldn't be surprised when they act like animals. Ideas have consequences. If you want to go down one verse, Romans 1.24 says, God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And then it goes on down through and you get this whole library of uh, lesbianism and homosexuality and uh, murder and, and all this, verse 29, this fornication, covetousness, envy, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. But it all started up when they denied the light of conscience and creation. And it all followed from there. Why should we expect it any different? The Bible predicted it. Here's a quote from an evolutionist, Aldous Huxley. Here's what he said. I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning... Consequently, I assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation we desire was simultaneously liberation from a certain political and economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. What's Huxley saying? I was convinced by the evidence and I became an atheist and an evolutionist. No, 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 no. He didn't like the fact that there were implications to there being a God. It put limits, moral limits on him that he objected to. You see, we should never back down one minute when an evolutionist or an atheist says, oh, that's just because you believe the Bible. That's ah, just because you were raised in a Christian church. That's ah, just because you were raised in a Christian home. Oh, yeah? 
Well, the reason you believe what you believe is because you don't want to have accountability to God. Folks, it's faith either way. It starts in the heart. Ultimately, it starts right here. It's a spiritual issue. And then it flows out from there. It's a spiritual issue. Romans chapter 1, verse 32 is the end result here. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in those that do them. I like to call this the unholy Romans road. It starts with denying conscience and creation. And then it goes on to rejecting God's revelation and they become fools. Then they hold to a belief that equates God's image with animals. Verse 23. And then God gives them up to immorality and nature worship. They're filled with all unrighteousness. And the last step we just read about is where they want to teach others also. I heard an interesting story years ago about a gentleman whose job it was to administer polygraph tests. Everybody know what a polygraph test is? Lie detector test. This was back when it was still legal to give polygraph tests as a condition for employment. And he worked for a large corporation and he traveled all around the country and he would administer these polygraph tests to prospective employees. And uh, he, he, the first step in a polygraph test, they'll hook you all up to it. And uh, I got Ralph back here. Ralph's, Ralph's my buddy. I got a good talk with Ralph afterwards, uh, after the morning service. So let's say I hook Ralph up to this, this lie detector t- the test. The first thing I'm going to do is say, okay, Ralph, I'm going to ask you some questions here and we're going to do what's called establish a baseline. We'll say, okay, uh, what's your name? And he's going to say, Ralph. Okay, that's very nice. Uh, do you have a shirt on? And he's going to say, yes. He said, well, why are you asking me these obvious questions? Well, when they administer a polygraph test, they want to kind of ask obvious questions that they know you're answering the truth to, and they're going to have this thing kind of bouncing up and down and establish this baseline. And then they'll say, Ralph, where were you on the night of June 16th? And he's going to say, I was at home. And he's going to go, beep! And says, oh, no, you're lying there, Ralph. Well, you're not telling the truth, right? Now listen to me. This guy travels all around the country. He said, as part of establishing a baseline, I would ask people, do you believe there's a God? He said, Dave, very interesting. I never had anybody tell me no, but the machine didn't go off the wall and prove him a liar. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Folks, what we hold in our hands is the Word of God. What we believe is a reasonable faith. We should never hesitate to go out and share that faith. We should have great confidence to go out and to proclaim the message of salvation. My question for you tonight is, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? You see, God has left us here for a purpose. God has a place for you. He has a place for me. If you're a believer, we have a responsibility for every day, for every week, for every month. Have you reached your neighbor? Pastor Phelps might be able to do a nice job explaining the plan of salvation to your neighbor, but he'll never have the opportunity to. You do. Or he might have the opportunity if you bring your neighbor to church. You say, well, I'm embarrassed. Well, folks, when you stand before God, that's not going to cut it. We're in a spiritual battle. Those folks that are ignorant that we're intimidated by are the same ones we're going to see dropping into hell someday. Christians over the years have been persecuted for their faith. They've lost their life and we're embarrassed to walk across the street and tell someone, you need to come on out. We've got some special meetings at our church. Hey, it's easy to invite somebody to science meetings. They might be intimidated to come on Sunday to Colonial Hills, Baptist, or Dr. Phelps. So well, come on out during the week and listen to Dino Dave. Just get him out. Maybe all this is very strange to you. Perhaps you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Perhaps if you and I were to sit down, you'd say, I'm an atheist, or maybe I'm not an atheist, but I've never been terribly interested in church matters. I've never really opened my Bible and studied this thing through. Maybe in the quietness of your heart, you'd have to be honest and say that if you were to die tonight, you don't know where you'd go. It'd be a leap in the dark for you. 
You know, the Bible says in the book of 1 John, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. I've talked about some scientific evidence for the existence of God. And that's wonderful. But merely acknowledging that there's a God is not enough. You can get there with general revelation. But you need specific revelation. You need God's Word to understand that God is a holy God. God is a just God. And we, as human beings, as a corporate human race, have turned our back on God. And we have followed a path of sin. We will follow a path of breaking His law. And until that sin is dealt with in your life and in my life and forgiven, we can never stand before God in a place called heaven. Jesus said, He that hath the Son of God hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Now listen to me, my friend. If you don't have the Son of God tonight, you don't want to walk out those doors tonight without Him. You want to deal with this matter tonight. If you were to die tonight, do you know where you'd go? If you don't, we'd sure love to sit down with you. Pastor Phelps would. I would. There's friends that are here in this place. Perhaps the person that brought you would love to sit down with you. And we'd love to share with you from God's Word how you could be saved. 